Greetings, it is I, Tantus Nav and Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. Today's going to be an exciting one. We are talking about Dungeons & Dragons, the 5th edition, 5th edition D&D, but you know, today I'm going to be talking about GMing. I've gone over character creation, I've gone over a lot of the basic rules in the rule book to help you out. This episode is all about game mastering, and a lot of the next couple of episodes are going to be about that. So, if you want to be a game master, start watching these. Or if you want to learn a little bit about what it means to be a game master, please do. So the basics of the Game Master is you're the crafter of the world. You're the master of the campaign and the storyteller. You're building a world and crafting a story that makes up your campaign. The series of adventures or misadventures your players will go on with their characters building up the entire story. The story of their existence. Whether the story is told in small vignettes, small adventures, or one overarching story arc is completely up to you and how you build that world. They could go on adventure here, adventure here, adventure there, or they could go on some kind of grand quest that would take them across the world. As the DM, you do not only design the world and invent everything, make up the story, you play all the parts in the world you are building. You play all the monsters, you play all the NPCs or non-player characters, all the people they would meet. Everything in the world is created by you, so you have to be a lot of different jobs at once. You have to be the actor, you have to be the referee, you have to be the crafter, the writer. There's a lot of jobs you have to take on as a DM, and it can be difficult, but it's fun to do. So the first part of the book, which because the book is, is divided into three parts, the first part is all about the type of campaign you want to run. Whether you're making up your own game world, you're using a, game, a war fantasy world from a movie or a novel, or you're using one of the pre-established ones that Wizards of the Coast has published on, such as Forgotten Realms, or Dragonlance, or even Greyhawk. Whichever one you're choosing to use, it's, you have to consider that's part of an ongoing multiverse of universe. It's not just one plane, it's a, one of many, the multiverse itself. Think of it this way, that if you're using a pre-established campaign, such as Forgotten Realms, you're only using that lore, and the world you are playing in is not the Forgotten Realms from the books or from the material. It's your own version of it that's slightly different than the others, that what's going on and it changes because of what your characters do, that the effects of it and what you're doing makes it it's your own unique version of it, but it still is the same thing. It's like parallel dimensions almost. You have to consider it that way, that you're one parallel world of many different versions of Forgotten Realms. So regardless, whatever setting, you're building that world. And an important part of building that world is, of course, consistency. If your players should come back to a village more than once, they should talk to the same barkeep or the same shopkeep. If something should have changed there, there should be a reason for it. They should find out about it. It's like, oh, what happened to Richard? Oh, Richard, he passed away. It was this horrible accident. I'm his son! Oh, hey, there's at least consistency there within the change that there's a story behind it, but otherwise, they should just meet the same person. They could be like, oh, hi, meet them again. Maybe the barkeep, if they happen to go to that bar a lot, recognizes them. And, oh, hey, you want the usual? Things like that that make the world feel alive. Consistency helps a lot. And, of course, yes, again, you can change things. But oftentimes, if you're going to change it, make some kind of storyline or plot point or sub-story related to it that your players will get interested in and want to investigate. If Richard died, maybe it wasn't an accident. Maybe that's a plot point for the current story, that maybe there's a murder in town that makes things look like accidents. Maybe his son suspects that. That could be the next adventure your players are going to go on, and hey, you've established it at the town they like to visit. It's as easy as that. But let's go on to part two of the book. Let's give a brief summary of that. That's the part where I'm choosing an adventure. Choosing an adventure is a very important part because you either have to make up an adventure of your own or you have to use one of the pre-published ones. Now, there's fine using either of them. You can use either material. You can make up your own or you can use the pre-published. The pre-published are actually really nice and can help you out. Using either is going to be time consuming. I I'm not going to deny that. It will probably take more time to write your own, but again, maybe not as much because you don't have to write as many details as are any published thing. When you're writing an adventure on your own, you're not writing it for other people to see. Like an adventure in one of the books that's pre-published is written that other people are going to read it. You have in your mind a lot of the information you might not have to jot down. Unless you're thinking of sharing it with people, you don't have to do the level of detail on that in the world you're crafting. So, interpreting it, figuring out what is in a book, or writing down whatever it is, both take time to build this adventure together and set it up that your players 
are ready to be thrown into it with their character. When building this adventure, you have to remember to craft all the NPCs, encounters, all the basic things of story, any kind of places they meet, all that important information that you have to craft together. So the last part of the book, which I will go again, I'm going to go into details of all these parts a little later in, a, in upcoming episodes, but the last part of the book talks about you as the GM and the rules. This is an important thing. You have to have read through at least the player's handbook and know all the rules from it. Do you have to memorize them? No. You have to be ready to be able to reference them, know a little bit about where to look for them, that sort of thing. That means I could be like, hmm, I'm not sure about how what this works. I can open the player's handbook, go to the correct page, and be like, oh, here's how it works. You have to have a general understanding of the rules because you as the GM, you're the referee. You're a moderator between the rules and the player. That's the thing is you have to moderate between the two of these things. A player will say, I want to do this. And then you either have to say, oh, you succeeded at that, or oh, you failed at that, depending on the situation, and you might call for a die roll. Calling for a die roll is the random chance of it. If it's something very simple that the players could just do, then sure, you could say you're successful. Or if it's something that it wouldn't be possible regardless, if something's like sealed in such a way that brute strength won't break it open, you could be like, it doesn't seem to be budging. It looks like you'll have to do something to it. Is there a die roll maybe involved? Maybe if they come up with something. If they say, oh, I'm going to do this. And the rules aren't going to account for everything. The rules are only going to account for a little bit. So if a player wants to do something very creative or interesting or try something else different, you have to be able to come up with the basic rules of it. Maybe it's a saving throw or maybe it's a ability check to do something. And you have to say like, oh, make a dex check to do that. And then they would make their dex check. And if they succeed at it, and you would tell them, of course, the difficulty of doing it, you wouldn't, make, you wouldn't mention the difficulty of it. You say, just make a dex check. You'd have a difficulty number in mind. If they made that difficulty number, you're, they're successful. You come up with what the results would be. Maybe you'll be generous and be like, oh, if they succeeded by a lot, you might make it a little better. If I'm trying to like swing on a chandelier and use it to get up to the third floor, and I was going from the second floor, maybe I succeeded in swimming across the other side of the second floor and landing safely, or maybe I got all the way up over there. It can be degrees of success too. It's depending on what a player wants to do and what the circumstances call for and whatever what they roll seems like it would accomplish. It is a complexity that is actually not very complex. You're just doing it to make it flow naturally. And the rules are an extension of that. And whatever rule, and this is again, this is rules that aren't really established. This is, you have to come up with something on the fly. The point of any of the rules is to keep limits on things. Let's give, for example, your characters can only move so much and around if they want to attack. If they want to move farther, that's exceeding the limits of the rules. It's succeeding the limits. The rules are made to limit players that they don't go crazy and they're not uncontrollable. That's what you should think of a mass. Not controllers, but limiters. That they can still do what they want, just limited by the rules. Now, you have to also recognize the types of players you have. Because recognize the type of players means you can adapt the story accordingly. You could have the players all be different types from the types I'm about to list in a minute, you could have them all be the same. You have to learn how to balance the types of players that you have under your control and whatever actions are happening in the game. Now you can have players that prefer acting. These are people that prefer to try to be their character, to act within their character, interacting with NPCs or other players. They're the ones that want to be their players. There's the type of players that enjoy exploring. These are the people that love delving into dungeons, finding traps, fighting monsters. It gaining treasure. There's those that like that. There's the investigators who like finding a mystery or a puzzle or something like that to solve it, to find something that's going on and learn the story of it is a better way of saying it, that they discover something and learn the story behind it through series of checks and decisions which lead them along the right path to find out what the actual answer to the questions they're, as questions they're asking about the story. There's the people that love fighting. They love fighting monsters, other NPCs. They love killing, maiming, attacking. They're all about the battle. There's the optimizing folks. These are the people that want to make their characters the best they can. They tweak their abilities, tweak their equipment, their magic items to come up with the most optimized character there are, to become the best versions of themselves. And there's the problem solvings. These are the people that love riddles and questions and things like that. It's similar to the investigation part, except rather than finding out the truth of the story is, their entire love is for the actual problem itself. Rather than trying to find out what the answer is, it's the, it's as I said, 
the riddle itself that is what they love to do. The various riddles or problem solving that you have to do that maybe they have to figure out some kind of puzzle actually in game. Or if, again, riddles are the easiest thing for problem solvers to have. But you can't have riddles all the time. You have to figure out ways of having them solve problems within the game. And the last one, storytelling. These are people heavily invested in the story and the narrative that you're building out. Their entire thing is to help push the story and narrative along and help the story evolve more. That's the kind of goal they have. When whatever types of players, or one type of player, if it's all the players are different types of players, whatever it is, you have to find the balance between them and recognize that so that you can, you can add in the components that make each one of them happy so that they have a good balance of all these things that they feel really enjoyable and enjoy the game. So that's it for today. I went over some of the basics of GMing. I told you, but it kind of means to be a GM and some of the things you have to work on. And of course, recognizing what type of player you have. In the next one, we're going to go into more detail on that first part, talking about the world you're using and helping design and develop that world that you're going to be using to play in and to have your characters running around in. So if you have questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe. Shows your support for the channel, for the empire, for the work I do. And until the next time, I bid you farewell.